Well, hello again, uh, kids and curious adults. Here we are with another teeny tiny technical tutorial from NOS LLC. That's me. We're going to look at data streams, uh, an advanced subject for the kids in my Kidtricity class. But it's um, this is one of the videos. Actually, no, I give it to them in PowerPoint uh, that they can study a bit more advanced subject than what we have time for in the class. Uh, they click on this little thing down here to hear my scintillating narration. You don't have to do that, of course. And I'm going to shorten this up considerably from what uh, they get in the uh, CD that I hand them. So we're going to look at uh, the uh, high-level pro uh, uh, processes of uh, data bit stream organization. Now keep this in mind because I do high-level stuff, conceptual stuff. It's it's what I tend to focus on because after so many years in the industry, I've found that that is the piece that's missing. You go to a lot of these technical seminars and they're designed for engineers. Most people are not engineers. So uh, keep that in mind that I've been uh, chastised on occasion for oversimplification and no doubt that's true. So uh, what are we going to talk about here? We're, we're going to talk about data. Now there's always been data around. In the beginning there were smoke signals, drum beats, signal fl flags, stuff like that. That's data because it's not voice. In my experience, um, that uh, from coming out of the telephone industry, the telecommunications industry, uh, in the early days there were only two things, analog voice information and digitized or numerical data information. They are very, very distinct. Over the years they've merged together. But let's look at this very early uh, data uh, information transfer. It's Morse code. It's made up of uh, these uh, five elements. Now most people think there's only two dots and dashes, but in fact there are timing elements too. So when this guy up here is sending information to some other person at the other end, he's using dots and dashes as his uh, 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 information uh, device, but he also has to put time intervals in here so that the receiving person can figure out that the dots and dashes he just sent represent a letter and then some time between uh, the uh, letters to understand that he made up a word and then some time between the words to made a, understand he made up a sentence. So there are actually five uh, signal elements involved in Morse code. We just usually think of them as having only two. Now how do you get around this, uh, this timing issue from one human to another trying to figure out well how much time was there between that dot and this dash you know that kind of thing well that's to send it as um, machine to machine rather than human to human and the earliest form of that interestingly enough 1842 is what we now call a, f uh, a telephoto or a facsimile and that uh, process is really very simple. I take a little cartoon of me right here on a piece of paper and I glue it to a rotating cylinder. And then I have a light shine down on the cylinder and a photocell pick up the light reflection. When the photocell sees a dark, that is no light coming back up from the paper, it will send voltage out on the wire. When it sees no dark, that is white paper, it sends no voltage. So as this thing rotates and this little pickup or this little uh, scan device sends this voltage on off on off on off that is sent over to a rotating uh, drum way over at some distant location and as the voltage comes in a little arm here will burn the paper when there's no voltage it won't burn the paper and then this thing over here moves down a notch and right the scan goes there bit pattern sent out this burns doesn't burn burns doesn't burn like that and you just kind of go down 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 until you get to the bottom of the drum and over here what will happen is here's some burn lines right here and right there and right there and right there and right there so you end up over here with a reasonable facsimile of the original thing right facsimile is that a good way to do it? Yeah, actually it is, and it's very simple because it worked way back in 1842. Although Alexander didn't use a drum, he used a flat piece of paper, but it doesn't matter. It's still um, a data exchange, not voice, right? Data exchange. But there's a couple things here and you need to be aware of, and one of the biggest things is synchronization. How does this thing get synchronized with this? Or actually, I should say this, get synchronized with that. Well, that's part of the issue of... Um, digital uh, synchronization that we're going to look at going forward. But first let me tell you this. 
in uh, voice, analog voice, there is also synchronization. We just don't think about it. So I talk, he listens. He talks, I listen. Right? Like that. There is a synchronization back and forth uh, between the two communicating entities, even in voice systems. Okay, so the problem we have in this industry, and believe me, this is partly why I do these high-level conceptual things, is that I'm trying to bring together effectively three different kinds of technologies. Here's the old foam board. That's me with my 10-pound beard and disco shirt. Uh, and we dealt primarily with analog kinds of things here, voice kinds of things. I'd walk 20 feet down to the telesite board and I had to handle digital kinds of things, uh, right? Computers talking to computers, only they weren't computers, they were teletype machines. That's what these are right here. And then, not shown because I didn't work on these systems, we had all these computer geeks having their own set of language. So we had phone geeks with their language. They had teletype geeks with their language and computer geeks with their language. And guess what? Over the years, all three of those have gotten merged together and it's no wonder everyone is confused. Right? So even I'm confused after all the years on occasion. So continuing on here, uh, that uh, issue of signal element timing um, in our voice systems is words and so on. We just do this automatically. But in data systems, we have to worry about all these other weird little things, bits, bytes, frames, packets, and so on. So that uh, issue of timing is very, very important. Now, there's three different ways that you can send information. Uh, simplex, just one way. That's a, like a PA. It's what we're doing right now. I'm talking to you, but you're not talking to me. At least I can't hear you. Uh, half duplex, which is one direction at a time. That is, I can send and I can receive, but I can't do both at the same time. And then there's full duplex. I can send and receive simultaneously at the same time. Interestingly enough, our phone systems are full duplex, but we choose to usually use them as half duplex. I talk, you listen, I talk, you listen. Even though the physical facility is capable of being uh, transmitting and receiving at the same instant. Okay, so we, we do, do, do need to be concerned about this issue of latency, and I have a an, an complete another tutorial on latency. Now, usually in voice, uh, the latency issue is handled subconsciously. We just wait for the other person to respond. But in data uh, transmissions, digi digital transmission in particular, digital data transmission, um, we've got to worry about this by engineering those issues into our systems. So how do we do that? If a uh, teletype machine is sending a string of, of digits to another teletype machine, how does the receiving teletype machine parse this string of digits into some kind of usable information? Well, the first thing is they've got to have some kind of code, right? So you, got, you need to ident identify the code. And then you have to have some kind of inner bit or inner keystroke timing process. So how do we do that? Well, the earliest system, a mechanical system known as, known as Baudot, used a motor. This is the end of a shaft on a motor, and it's got these little slip rings out here. And when uh, the, you hit a, a key on a teletype machine, a particular pattern of uh, voltage would be applied to these little individual bit wires right here. So I'd have, let's say, volts on this little piece of slip ring, and no volts on this one, volts on this one, no volts on that one. When you'd hit the key, what would happen is a little latch would let this arm start rotating because there's a, like a clutch on it. So as the arm came around here, it would pick up the voltage patterns right here and transfer it through this little piece of metal right here to this slip ring right here. And that voltage pattern would be sent across the wire out here to a receiver. Now, the first thing that comes up is, well, how does this little thing here know when to start rotating to be in, in synchronization with this? Well, the way it was done was there was a start marker position that was sent over here to say, start rotating. And then the bit pattern for the actual keystroke that took place down here. And then a stop uh, bit over here to say, this, we're done. So each one of the keystrokes would then have one rotation like that, which would make this go around one time and then it would stop. It was called um, Baudot start stop. Not very efficient. Also because I only had five signal elements here you couldn't make a whole lot of uh, different things. 
it was enough to handle the uh, keyboard, uh, teletype keyboard, but not much else. Okay, so a better way to do that is to um, not put start stop around each one of the characters or keystrokes. It was to group them all together and put a, con a, a device in the front, a pattern of bits that said to the receiver, get ready, here's the stuff, now we're done. It's called framing. Additionally, as we went forward, we, we came up with better codes. Uh, instead of uh, Baudot, ASCII. ASCII still used today, but there is an even more uh, recent code, the Unicode Universal Character Set. I don't want to get too far into that. but So the, the way we can do the synchronization is to have a start and stuff and then a stop for the whole thing rather than start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, like that. Okay. Even more efficient is to do it like this. Go into what is generically called a framing structure. And uh, those of you who have looked at my other tutorials like on T-type and E-type carrier know that word. My, there's a different, looks different. The framing structure there looks different, but the concept is still the same. Is that I have a, st excuse me, a start marker kind of uh, device over here. In this case, it's a unique pattern of bits that doesn't occur anyplace else in here. So this is the, get ready, dude, here comes some stuff. And then here's, here's where the stuff ought to go. And here's some stuff about what the stuff is. And then here's the stuff. And then check to see if the stuff got to you OK by looking at this weird little number I'm going to make up over here. And then finally, hey, dude, I'm all done. Well, this is called a framing structure. Much more efficient. It also gives us the ability to synchronize the receiver to the transmitter because we can put bits up here that are like um, synchronization bits. That's what the start marker is in this instance. But something like um, a particular LAN, you could just have a whole con uh, a string of bits like 101010101010 like that, which would be like a clocking process to keep everybody synchronized. We can carry that even further is once we've established that we're going to frame our information in this instance um, a high level data link control frame we're going to frame our information so that the receiver uh, can synchronize to the transmitter we can also say we want to be able to take our information out of our like local area network this uh, framing structure right here could get you from one computer to another within a local area network but let's say we want to take our information out of our local area network and send it across the internet. Well, what we can do there is have a package inside of a package. It's called a packet down here. This is the actual information we want to send from one computer in New York to another computer in Los Angeles. This will tell us that we want to go from New York to Los Angeles. This just tells us we want to go someplace within the land. This tells us we want to go someplace outside of the land right here. And so once again, we have this synchronization from end to end so that everybody knows this set of bits right here means something. This set of bits means something, right? This is a letter or a number or something right here. So everybody is synchronized that way. OK, so I'm going to beat you once again on this. Some of you have heard this before. Um, I really have an issue with this because I deal at this conceptual level and the conceptual level is mangled badly by the words high speed data because when you're trying to figure out how this stuff really works this just messes you up big time. I'll give you an example. I've got one second window and I'm going to put 10 bits in here binary digits right 10 bits mark space mark space volts on volts off volts on but whatever I don't even know what this means at this point doesn't matter it's just 10 bits that occupy one second of time those electrical bits are moving down the wire let us say at 500 miles per hour that's their speed the number of bits I have in a one second window is 10 bits per second. So the bit rate is 10 bits per second. The speed is 500 miles an hour. If I compress those bits down in time so they only occupy a half a second, they're still moving at 500 mile per hour speed. They are still 10 bits per second on the line. But now, down here, I take my 10 bits and I add somebody else's 10 bits that have been compressed down. And then when one second of time now, I have 20 bits per second rate, all of which 
are moving at 500 miles per hour. This is the speed of the signal. This is the rate of the signal. They are not the same. And if you're just learning this stuff, every time you hear this, you probably get the idea that somehow that little bit right there has a little rocket attached to its back end and it's going down that wire faster. Not true. So it's an important concept. That's why I'm beating you to death again. Yeah. So back to the bottom line on this, information exchanges take place in time. The timing elements can be implicit, like when we're talking, listen, talk, and listen, talk, and listen, or they have to be built into the system. Right? They require, digital data exchanges require specific timing elements built into these protocols that will keep us structured, often in what's just called framing. So there you go, 10-4, Roger. Over and out, rubber ducky.